Yeah? So fortunately, not too much coding and stuff. Actually, no coding at all. It will be all conceptual. So if you want to see some hands-on stuff, you might go to the other sec uh, session, which is about activity as well, workflows. So this session is about ad adaptive case management. It's, uh, it's one concept um, which is yeah, it's not totally new, but it came up a couple of years ago with the publishing of one of a book. There is now a second book. Um, we'll look today into what adaptive case management is and how it can be implemented in Alfresco. Um, originally, I planned to present some live stuff here as well, but this is a community project we just started in Jakarta, and we are kind of behind schedule. So the code, which um, kind of proves um, what, what, what I'm going to talk about, will be launched and published uh, later this month. I hope that it can be done next week, most probably uh, in two weeks of time. So. Um, this is about adaptive case management and activity and work and uh, alfresco and how we can implement it. So um, just a quick introduction uh, about myself. Um, my name is Jörg Sauer. I'm currently working with uh, Allianz Life Indonesia, um, heading the application development department there. Um, I used to be a freelance trainer, consultant developer uh, with a relationship to Alfresco as a certified instructor doing many Alfresco projects. So um, what we have done um, is that we have introduced activity as our workflow engine. So we are running workflows with activity and um, we are integrating activity with our core applications and in an insurance company as you uh, um, can imagine we have many things to do with cases. Yeah? So it's uh, new business stuff, it's claims, and so on. So we have to do with case management. And um, when it comes to case management, there are things which work very well, and there are things that, which are not necessarily working very well. And that's why I picked this topic for today. Um, um, I'm part of the Alfresco uh, community in, in Jakarta. We normally run a monthly meetup. Uh, we have a kind of a core team of five which show up every time and it's kind of intense discussions on Alfresco and uh, yeah so we, we thought we thought about what we can we do to get some hands-on practice and we picked this topic as kind of a, an exercise so we are going to implement a toolkit or we are actually already doing a toolkit if, if you want to follow me I have a Twitter account and uh, yeah sometimes I block but the last 12 months I didn't, so I have to, <laughs> I have to catch up again. OK, so again, what is this today about? It's about introduction into knowledge work, so that everybody understands what is knowledge work. It's about challenges with uh, business process management. It's about what is adaptive case management. And then we will have a quick look into Alfresco, what it, does, what it provides out of the box to support co uh, case management and um, what activity provides out of the box to support case management and, it, what, and what needs to be done and to be customized to get this adaptive case management or case management in general working in Alfresco. Yeah, and finally, a conclusion. And I brought some t-shirts, so I, um, after the presentation I will have some questions and uh, whoever can uh, answer the question gets a t-shirt from the Alfresco Jakarta community meetup. Okay, so introduction to knowledge work. How or what does a knowledge worker look like? Yeah, so if you see at the crowd, they are happy, but you cannot tell who is a knowledge worker and who is not a knowledge worker. Yeah? So maybe this is a knowledge worker, or these are knowledge workers. Yeah, these are professors from the university, and of course they deal with big knowledge. Yeah? They are in science and they do research. And uh, that's how professors look like in Indonesia, actually. Um, so, um, but are they really knowledge workers? So they deal with knowledge, they lecture, they transfer knowledge, but not necessarily they are knowledge workers. Um, a librarian. Is a librarian a knowledge worker? Of course, there is lots of knowledge in the library, but if you just, you know, check in, check out books. If you just put the books back into the shelf, do the labeling and stuff, if you get new books, it's not necessarily knowledge work, right? 
It's just ordinary routine work, which is done by a librarian. Um, so what about firefighters? Firefighters are definitely knowledge workers. Why? Any ideas why a firefighter is a knowledge worker? Yeah, they do decisions, correct. Yeah, so they have some kind of routine. So when they arrive at a play, you know, at a location where a fire is, they they get the, the hoses all set up and stuff. Yeah, but afterwards they have to make a decision where to start and what to do uh, based on the conditions they find um, um, in this incident. The same goes for paramedics, right? They arrive at an accident scene and then they have to make they have to assess the situation. They have to determine the cause of the action, and then they do stuff. Yeah, of course, they have also some kind of guidelines, what they should do first and what they should do second. But depending on the severity of the accident or the, in, um, the condition of the patient, they might skip certain things just to make sure that the person survives. So stock exchange is another area for knowledge workers. Those knowledge workers, they base their decisions on a, on a huge source of, of information. Yeah? So yeah, they get some news, and so they sell, or they buy, or whatever. Um, policemen or police investigators are also knowledge workers. They gather clues, they follow up, and then they discover some nice things. And um, so. Knowledge work is actually everywhere. Yeah? It's in rescue work. It's in complex insurance or bank transactions. It's in police legal investigation, financial audits. Coordinating a meeting is knowledge work because you have to figure out who to whom to invite, set up the agenda. Maybe there are some kind of things you have to think about. So setting up a meeting might be knowledge work as well. Um, Exceptions like billing disputes, that's definitely knowledge work because you have to look into the case and figure out why there is a dispute. Is it valid or isn't it? Um, medical treatment, of course, help desk hiring, and all the stuff the executive management is doing, right? So management, um, knowledge work is actually everywhere. And um, the quality of knowledge work is that it is normally not repeated. You schedule a meeting once, and you, you do the preparation of the meeting once, but another meeting looks differently. Two murder investigations are not the same. Different case, different coincidence, uh, different uh, um, crime scene, different murder weapon clues and stuff. Complex insurance claims are not the same. Maybe there is a medical precondition which hasn't been filed in the application and stuff you know, like this. And there are endless examples to knowledge work. And uh, one criteria of knowledge work is that it is non-repeatable. So um, and this is important when it comes later to implementing workflows and stuff. If something is not repeatable, it's not necessarily a good thing to automate, right? Um, another thing about knowledge work is that it is unpredictable. So there might be some cases where you can you know, anticipate certain things to happen. Yeah? But you never know what is really going to happen. Yeah? If it's a legal case, maybe there are some um, um, new findings which then turn the whole thing around. Maybe we'll, Samsung will win over Apple about this kind of patent war they are currently having. Nobody knows. Medical claims uh, might not be valid because yeah, uh, there is a no, uh, wrong statement made in the application, conflicting factors that impact decision making. So um, knowledge work is non-repeatable. It's somehow unpredictable. And um, knowledge work is also emergent, meaning whenever we have new facts, we might have to adjust the course of the case, yeah? like, in a doc like in a medical case. The doctor runs a test. He comes to some conclusion. He prescribes. He, he comes up with a treatment plan. He pr prescribes some medication, and after a time, it's being reassessed, re-examined, 
and maybe the medication is not working, so we have to come up with another thing. Yeah, so Joram likes uh, Dr. House, so he is an expert in, in these kind of things. Um, and so whenever we do knowledge work, the knowledge worker always has to look into the things and has to be flexible what's, com what's coming up and adjust the course. And um, the last thing about um, knowledge work is that the knowledge work itself is robust. So you cannot easily kind of, of um, you know, derail a knowledge worker. He is used to certain situations which are challenging or whatever. And he will always, if it's a good knowledge worker, he will always find a solution to the problem. And um, this is actually crucial for our industries nowadays. So if you don't have good knowledge workers, the, in, the industry cannot perform. And high velocity and high reliable uh, organizations, they run on knowledge work. Yeah, it's not the assembly belt and the textile plant, uh, the textile industry, you know, which, which is doing the so same thing of the same t-shirt a million of times. OK. So um, as a background, we have to look a little bit into the development of um, the industrialization and how we um, came to where we are currently. So in the um, early 90th, uh, 19th century, 1840 to 1920, actually, there was industrialization. And the whole thing was about mass production. So they set up plants. They identified the steps necessary uh, to do some things. And then they uh, exactly followed the procedures and produced certain things 1,000 times, 10,000 times, 100 of times, 1,000 of times, how many things they wanted to produce. Um, the initial cost to set up the whole production was kind of high. But um, producing one single item was relatively cheap then because it was all automated um, or, let's say, defined. And the cost, the initial cost of setting up the whole thing was kind of distributed over the many copies, identical copies that they were producing. So the first guy who did some research on, on these kind of things was uh, this Mr. Taylor here. And in the 1940s, actually, some guy from Toyota, he thought, you know, it's stupid if he, buy, if he produce, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, a certain part of the car 10,000 times. Because then we have it in the warehouse. Whenever something is in the warehouse, it gets lost, it gets broken. Or we come up, we want to do some changes on the model because this part is not working very well. And then we have still these 10,000 pieces in the warehouse. And if we are going to uh, create something new, then we have to either dispose of the existing stuff or write it off by, any, uh, by other means. So he said that mass production is actually not good. Mass customization is good. And excess production is waste because of cost for warehouses and, and all these kind of things. So and this was when uh, Kanban or lean um, management and lean production was being invented. And this was kind of state of the art until the, um, let's say, 1980s. And from 1980s, there was another research going on. And that this was being done by Mr. Drucker. And uh, he just thought, OK, you know, just in time is fine. But we have more to do than just production. So he came up with a with a yeah, he didn't necessarily come up with a term, came up with a term knowledge work, but he was one of the guys identifying that um, knowledge work is important and that the knowledge worker is someone who knows more about the job than anybody else in the organization. And nowadays, most of us, yeah, especially in this context here, are knowledge workers, right? We could not uh, develop software applications or solutions if you are not knowledge workers. I could not manage a team of 50 developers if I'm not a knowledge worker. I could not handle all the business requests without being a knowledge worker. So uh, definitely, I guess most of you here in the room are knowledge workers. So when we look at these kind of concepts, mass production and uh, so on, we see um, that the predictable area is mass production and routine work. Yeah? For, for mass production, we ne actually need routine work. Yeah? So producing an iPhone at uh, Foxconn is routine work, yeah? mass production. Um, designing the iPhone 
and kind of coding the iOS and stuff is definitely not mass production, right? So we might still have some things which are mass production and routine work, and we have definitely have things which are, sorry, which are just in time or knowledge work. So just in time is still the automobile industry. You order your car, you pick the colors, the seats, and all this, you know, all the accessories, and then the, car, the, the parts just arrive at the, assembly belt in the mo uh, at the assembly belt in the moment um, your car is being assembled. So this is just in time. And in order to make just in time possible, you need knowledge workers dealing with incidents and with kind of conditions coming up. And one um, major thing here about just in time and knowledge work is it's unpredictable. So if you are going into an automobile factory, for example, the truck with the parts being required to produce a specific part might be involved in an accident. So he will be, he will be late. Yeah? The, the car will be late, the truck. So they have to rearrange the production to, to produce some other cars first until the, car, the parts which are in the truck arrive. Yeah? So there are definitely some guys dealing with this production management and planning and stuff, and these are knowledge workers. And this is unpredictable, and down here it's predictable. Okay? So um, there has been some research in the past couple of years about knowledge workers and what it is all about. And um, the figures are kind of difficult to identify. So there is an estimate that at least 30 to 50 percent of all workers are knowledge workers. In the developed countries, actually, um, the numbers are much higher. In the developing countries, like Indonesia, for example, the numbers are most probably lower, yeah, because we are doing lots of this mass production stuff in China as well. Um, but the interesting fact about knowledge work and, and these figures is it's constantly increasing. So the higher developed an industry is, or a country or nation is, the higher dependent uh, is the, uh, they uh, the more dependent they are on, on knowledge workers, and necessarily um, these figures are going to increase. The problem with knowledge workers is they are high pay. Yeah, whoever is looking for a software developer knows if you are uh, looking for skills which are in high demand, you have to open the purse and spend some extra money to get them on board. Um, and they are the key area of economical growth in economies, especially in developed countries, but also uh, more and more in developing countries. And um, they are a key factor for developed countries to stay competitive. Yeah? So if uh, we don't deal properly with knowledge workers, we cannot stay competitive. So the guy who figured this out, or one of the guys, is this Tom Devonport. So now, coming, off, coming to the cost of implementation and the complexity of implementation for certain things. Um, here you see system-to-system -system processes. So I have my core system and I have my data warehouse, for example. So I have to expect some data from the core system, ship it into the data warehouse, easy. Easily to understand. We know the requirements. We can implement it. So that's relatively easy. We can automate these things. Yeah, system integration is always about automation. Yeah, you don't want to do manual things, right? If you, are in the, if you use Alfresco and you want to put your content into the cloud, if Alfresco is providing some functionality for it, you just rely on that it's working, right? You, don't, you maybe just configure when the files are being shipped or what kind of files are being shipped or what kind of things are replicated. But after this, everything is going automatically. You implement it once, the implementation costs are relatively small, and it works. So these kind of things are easy to implement or easier to implement, and they are more or less routine work, and the bill here is relatively small. When it comes to human pr processes, but routine human processes, right? Um, for example, in a bank, you open in a bank account. This is pretty straightforward procedure. There is normally nothing special about it unless you are uh, one of the super rich and you want to put 2 billion euros in the account. That might be a special case. But you know, if we are going to, um, I assume, yeah, no, million, no billionaire among us, right? Um, so if we are going to a bank opening account, it's pretty straightforward. But it's already going into the gray area between routine work and knowledge work. 
and it might be more difficult to implement because if we are dealing with humans, as we know, we always have certain ideas how things look, should look like. Um, if we don't provide the proper user interface, the usability sucks, the people don't like the system, the quality of the data or whatever goes down. And um, also in a um, document management system like Alfresco, if the user interface is not nice, the people will, will still keep their documents on a file share and they are not going to use it, uh, the document management system. So the adaptation rate will be, will be low. Um, so the knowledge workers, they are a different breed. So knowledge workers, they know how to do things, and they don't want to be told how to do things, right? So maybe you can, you know, if you have a junior developer, you can tell him, OK, write this code lines like this and uh, do it like that. But once he becomes senior, he doesn't want to hear this story, right? He wants to do it by himself. He knows how to do it. Um, so with knowledge workers, it's difficult. and um, as, you, as I have told you before, it's not predictable. It's um, also um, emerging, so it changes all over the time. Yeah? And, and that's why to implementing something here is really difficult, and it costs lots of money. Yeah? And it's also not necessarily repeatable. Yeah? And that's why implementing something here, we have to be a little bit careful. Um, the value of implementing something increases the higher I get, but the cost is also, and the complexities are also increasing. So now, having a look at business process management. So business process management is a good thing. It's mature, the industry is mature, the tools are cool, activity is great. Um, so we have designers, we have um, all the tools like business uh, activity monitoring, central event processing, and all this fancy stuff. We can monitor our, our, our KPIs, our SLAs, all cool stuff. However, if you want to come up with a, with a workflow or with a process, we have high upfront investment in process analysis, analysis in kind of coding the stuff. And the return of investment just comes it's like with mass production, if we run the whole thing a thousand times or even more. Yeah? So um, all the big, um, 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 the big uh, um, BPM tools, they actually allow us to, to do some simulation. Draw, maybe we can get simulation on activity as well. <laughs> Um, so simulation, so you can pop, uh, pop in some parameters, and then uh, you will get these figures. OK, originally, this takes five minutes. If I automate it, it just takes two minutes. The cost of one res human resource I have sitting there doing the manual job is so much per hour, so I get the benefit or revenue of so such and such. So this is great marketing talk from, all, from, the, you know, from the big uh, BPM, and, uh, BPM vendors. But it not necessarily works because it only works with routine jobs and routine work. Yeah. So if we do sewing t-shirts, yeah, this is routine work, we can automate it. If we are opening bank accounts, we can automate it. Any questions so far? Everything clear? Yeah. So now coming to some real life uh, business process issues. So business processes are not, well, not necessarily well understood. Yeah, if you go into a company as a consultant and you ask, you know, explain me your business process, you will get, you ask five people, you get five different versions. And if you ask a user, he just knows what he is doing. Yeah? So like in the iPhone production plant, he is taking the back plane and putting uh, the back cover and putting the, the, the board in. The next one is screwing it. The third one is putting in the display or whatever. Yeah, So they know what they are doing, but they don't see the whole picture. Um, then it's scope. You'd ask five people what the business process is about, and they tell you a different scope. The top management has this scope. The underwriting department in the insurance company has this scope. The, sc the claims department this scope. And um, so that's always a problem. And then. Um, it's also a problem that the management is not necessarily just interested in the cost to set up the whole thing in KPIs, in SLAs, maybe in headcount. 
Yeah, and all the things which are having on the target letters, that's what they are focusing on, but not necessarily to get the business process right. And um, to get the business process analyzed, you are relying on internal resources, most probably. The internal resources don't have the sufficient skill to do this job because it's complex. Um, and um, once you want to bring in external consultants, everybody is seeing, okay, external consultants equals project equals solve all problems. And this is creating a bigger problem, right? If you want to solve, uh, if you want to solve one problem with uh, one solution fits all approach, it never works. So um, then you also have conflicts among uh, stakeholders. Scope issues, as I mentioned, goals are not defined. They always want to have end-to-end -end process. Not thinking about the small parts, but you will start here, insurance application, and then it's over the whole lifetime. Uh, it's all in one process. And that not necessarily works well. So there is also a misconception that uh, a business process implementation will solve business problems. And this is not necessarily the true, right? If you have a problem in business, just by putting in some tools will not necessarily solve your problem. So you have to understand your problems first, then you have to address them, meaning you have to fix them on the business end, and then you are going to be able to, might be able to implement something in BPM. The other thing is, um, ah, now we want to implement some BPM solution, some workflow, so let's change our business process in parallel. So meaning you have an established process where you, which is almost working, maybe has some flaws, and now you change the process because you have a project to come up with a new solution. Yeah? So you change the business process, you implement the workflow for the first time, and then you launch it and it doesn't fit together, right? So you create more problems. Um, yeah, this is um, that you, ne you not necessarily know if you automate something, um, if the change will work, right? So it's kind of try and error. Change requests, production support requests, and stuff like this. And um, the focus on the end-to-end -end, end -end processes also brings problems. It's overly complex. You easily get process diagrams which are printed three meters by five meters in uh, size. Um, not all things can be foreseen. It's a huge effort to gather the requirements. The users not necessarily can help. Uh, it's a huge effort to get a sign-off because various stakeholders have various ideas and then they start fighting and then you have these guys sitting in the meeting and saying, yeah, yeah, everything is fine or they just be, stay quiet until it comes to the sign-off and then they raise all their change requests. No, this is wrong, this is wrong, that is wrong. So it takes uh, months to get the whole thing done. Um, sorry. And uh, there are always compromises. And the, the, my actually my uh, experience is that once it is implemented, even if the tool support versioning and stuff and you can change it, it will just stay like this for years. So, and then they make changes in the business side, they change the process, but the workflow is still the same. So they kind of, you know, they adjust, they tweak things so it's going to work. And that's actually why um, many business process management uh, implementations are failing. And because it's not necessarily routine work, it's complex, and uh, all these kind of factors I have talked about. Yeah, the optimistic flow. Um, so it's just, you know, ah, nothing will go wrong. You just do it that way, and then uh, yeah, suddenly something goes wrong, we have to deal with it. Um, so the current approach with BPM is like this. The process drives everything. The process is predictable, it's implementable as awesome, as automated process. The return of investments will come over the time. And if you do the CBAs on a workflow project, they are always looking good. And after implementation and five years in production, ah, okay, different story. Um, and this is actually the image how it works. The process is a focus or the center, and the data is just secondary. So now coming to knowledge workers. What do you think is the most important thing a knowledge worker needs? Hmm? Research. Research. Uh, what else? Information. Information. Okay, that was the right answer I was looking for. What's your size? <laughs> Large. Large, okay. 
Um, should have prepared myself. Ah, this is large. Who was it? Okay. So there are more t-shirts. <laughs> um, okay, so it's information. And um, I come back to this slide. So the information or the data is actually at the center of a knowledge worker process, right? So the data drives the process, or the information drives the process. And um, the guys who came up with this kind of adaptive case management idea is actually uh, Ka Keith Swenson with uh, some co-authors. And he also this um, really great book, Mastering the Unpredictable, which is about the concepts. And then a couple of years later, they came up with some case studies, how these kind of things can be implemented. This is the theory. This is the implementation case studies from real life uh, um, um, companies. And, and they have implemented these kind of things. And it's really good reading. And um, coming back here to what it's all about. So the data is the center, not the process. The process is not carved in stone. We have to be flexible. The worker decides on the step. But of course, he needs some guidance. So there are SOPs. If they make sense or not, that's a different question. If you follow them accordingly, it's another one. But at least there is some framework which guides you through the process or some rules which you have to obey. Um, but it's not carved in stone. You can be flexible. Yeah? For example, uh, in our company currently, we came up with some compliance issues. So we now have this nice 88-page procurement uh, SOP. So now I got it, wanted to get a training. It took me four months to get the training, price $5,000. In the same time, we did an investment for the new data center, $1 million. It took the same time. So there is definitely something wrong with the SOP or be, uh, with the SOP or actually following it. But um, you know, we need some guidance. And the most important thing is that we need a holistic view on data and information. And this is actually a problem when it comes to document management systems. Why is this? Why is this? What is the problem? Why is this uh, crucial or critical when it comes to knowledge workers in document management systems? Yeah. So what's your size? <laughs> M. OK, that's cool. <laughs> Who was it? <laughs> Who was it? Hmm? OK. <laughs> Hi, cool. OK. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, it's unstructured data. So the unstructured data is not necessarily in the, uh, in the content or in the document management system. But we have to bring it on. Otherwise, um, um, uh, or, no, it's, actually, I was looking for structured data. Give me, your, give me, give me back your. <laughs> no, you can keep it. It's my mistake. Uh, <laughs> so it's not just the unstructured data, because the unstructured data is, of course, in the document management system. We can bring in the emails and all the stuff, right? But the structured data, which is in our legacy systems, in our insurance applications, whatever you have in your business, right? This is a problem, because this is not here. When you are working on a case in an insurance company, for example, we have a, we have a um, what do we have? Um, we have a call center. So we register all the call. We record the calls. And when it comes to a claim, it might be crucial that we get the information of one of the previous calls the customer made to the call center. Because maybe he had made a statement which kind of you know, invalidates a claim. So this kind of information is not necessarily in the document management system, but we have to bring it in call history, tape recordings, and all this kind of stuff. So when it comes to adaptive case management, the data is at the center. And, uh, but we have to bring in the external data as well into the view. Um, so the comparison is business process management versus active, uh, adaptive case management. This is routine work, and this is knowledge work. You work on checklists, you assess data, and then you decide what kind of steps you take next. So um, Alfresco, of course, provides uh, data lists. Yeah, So cool case management. Yeah, but of course, it needs more than just uh, the data list. So a knowledge worker requires guidance and rules. Um, and um, there should be an adaptable approach. In Alfresco, we could use for, or not, not, not just in Alfresco, everywhere, we could use templates or filing structures. So normally, you put all the documents into one location or into one, into one view. Um, you need checklists. 
these can be templates as well, so you have a guidance. Um, you, you need small workflows, not the big ones. For example, if you are working on a medical case in a claim, you might need an assessment in external. So you have to find an expert who can do, you can examine um, the patient and, 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 uh, and figure out if he is just uh, pretending or if he's really sick, for example, right? And, and these kind of small workflows can support, you know, looking for the expert. Once you found the expert, the information is in the system and the, work, the small workflow is over. And um, you need customizable elements because if it's just static, it might not work um, to gather and compile all the information the user needs to work on the case. And of course, you need collaboration because a knowledge worker normally interacts with other people. It's not just one guy doing the whole thing. Right? The firefighter needs his peers. If he's going into the house to get some, to rescue someone who is trapped, yeah, he needs somebody behind him who might get him out if he's getting trapped. Right? Otherwise, it will be suicidal. Um, you need holistic data and information. So you need the visibility of the documents, of structured information, of communication, of historical data, for example, call center calls and stuff, and related cases. Yeah, sometimes even if the case is not repeatable, yeah, having a look at a different, if a similar case might help to figure out what to do, right? Um, so, there is one statement made by this uh, Peter Drucker guy, and he said, knowledge worker, the knowledge worker productivity is the biggest of the 21st century's management challenges. And um, I think all of us will agree that the management not necessarily puts the highest focus on, on knowledge workers. They are putting the focus on the, on the quarterly reports, financial statements, uh, I don't know, gross figures. But how we achieve the growth, how we make the stakeholders or the, um, the investors happy, that's mm, uh, very often of secondary concern. And how to retain our knowledge workers, yeah, to make sure that they're happy and not jumping the ship and moving to another company is also not necessarily the highest priority of certain areas within the company. So, um, and for developed countries, it's a first survival requirement. So now China is catching up, Indonesia is catching up, they're slow. Africa is far behind, but at some point they will re reach the same level as we are, as we are currently having. So how do we maintain our status quo? with knowledge workers. Yeah, why is Germany doing so well in the Euro crisis? Knowledge workers. Yeah, no offense for non-Germans here. It's, uh, but I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's important that we have uh, knowledge workers. So coming now to case management with Alfresco. Does Alfresco provide case management out of the box? No. It has a potential. There is no case management solution. Yeah? So Alfresco is a, is a great document management system, and it provides lots of functionality. But there is, it's not solution-centric. So I, doesn't, I don't have any solution out of the box for, for healthcare. I don't have it for, for case management. I can build it, but it's not, not in there. Um, can Alfresco do case management? Of course. Yeah? If you do some tricks and, and do some adjustments, it can do case management. And, um, if you have to do many things or just a few, that depends on our requirements. So you can get a simple case management solution implemented pretty quickly and in almost no time. Um, who is doing case management with Alfresco? Many companies. Yeah, so for example, the Allianz in Australia, they're using Alfresco, they're doing case management. Um, who is implementing case management in Alfresco? You. Most probably, otherwise you wouldn't sit here. Partners and the community. So we are starting now in Jakarta, or we started already, <laughs> and then this will be available. Um, so let's have a look at the uh, default case management support in Alfresco. So we can have folder structures, and we can build up templates. And the template can, you know, be, be, uh, so we, whenever we get a new case, we just pull the template, the folder structure is in place. This is being adjustable by users. So a, a knowledge worker can, or a team of knowledge workers, they can uh, just adjust the templates and pull it. 
we have small workflows like the ad hoc workflow, which might help to support certain case management uh, requirements. We have rules and actions, so we can configure certain things. When we do something, we send an email to somebody. When, we, uh, when, when something happens, we run a script, which is, for example, fetching some data from a, from a source, external source, from a CSV file, putting it on the files. So we can, with, the exist, with these existing things, we can do already many things in our fresco. We just have to use them and have to be a little bit creative. Yeah? And we have the simple workflows, so we can set up folders, and we can link them, and then we can assign this simple workflow stuff, and then we can just push a button, OK, document goes in here, we go into review, we go into approve, reject it goes back here, and then finally it will end up in published. Um, can be also case related, of course. Yeah? We can have tags. So we can say, OK, this is a claim document, and we just tag it with, uh, with something here. It's a claim, and then a claim number. So we can search stuff. This is out of the box. Nothing, nothing uh, customized, um, which can also use, which we can already use to do some simple case management stuff. And um, as there is no big BPM, BPM process, this is already adaptive, right? Because a knowledge worker can kind of adjust what he wants to do. Um, so, but if you want to implement a case management uh, solution. What kind of functionality does our Fresco provide here? So we have con custom content models. So we can create certain types for claims, for um, whatever documents you are dealing with with your case. You can have certain folder types. These folder types help to organize you, um, your claim structure. You can put metadata not only on, fold, uh, on documents, but also on folder. You can implement something which kind of synchronizes the metadata from, ex for example, an external system with structured data, put it on the folders, and then propagate it down to the documents. Or you can tweak the, ch the search that all the documents um, will be searchable by information which is only sitting on the folder, because you not necessarily want to look at a document and see all the metadata attached. Yeah? And uh, depending on what kind of cases you're working on, the metadata can be really huge. Yeah, but you can implement something which propagates the data down to the documents virtually. So it's not really physically sitting there, but you will, can make sure that you still find it on the document. Um, you can have custom workflows. You can use web scripts. And this is actually really cool with Alfresco because with web scripts, you can integrate third party applications or systems with, uh, with, uh, with very simple uh, means. And um, this is, for example, um, to trigger events which are creating filing structures for cases which um, do metadata synchronization one way, two way, it's up to you, status updates, and uh, so on. And of course, you can use it for extending our frescoes and shares functionality. Another thing is with case management that you need aggregated views. So you need, a let's say, one sheet of paper where all the information is on. And as I mentioned, not necessarily all the information is coming from um, the document management system. So with FreeMarkart, you can create templates, components, and reports, which just aggregate all the information and make it available. For example, if you have an SOP, it not necessarily go, you don't necessarily copy the SOP into the case folder. You just want to you know, you see all the documents which are required for your case, but you don't want to have them all in the folder structure, right? So you can reference documents with uh, some free marker templates, which you kind of pull into the um, page view on the share um, side in order to have them available. And uh, this can all be done easily um, with free marker. And uh, another thing is you can come up with some custom actions, um, create a case, start a workflow, sync information, generate status reports. You can use transformations to generate status reports and also to do full text index on holistic data. So whenever your document comes in, you know it, it's, run, it's in the background, it's being transferred, uh, translated or transformed into a text file which is being indexed. But who tells you uh, that this indexing just is being based or this transformation has to be based just on the information which is in the file? So you can rewrite your or implement a different transformer which 
takes all the other information in, additionally to the uh, kind of um, to the uh, full text, and pushes it over to the uh, to the indexer so that the information is also available in the full text index, and you don't have to have all the metadata properties sitting on the document, for example. Yeah? Synchronization, of course, or replication is sharing documents with external stakeholders. Um, that's all out of the box functionality of our fresco. Data lists, checklists, yeah? knowledge workers need checklists. They have to check, done, done, done. And they have to come up with new topics uh, or with new points within the, in the tool so that they go, don't lose track of what they are working on. And um, actually, these checklists or data lists can be integrated into workflows. So we can create a workflow which is, for example, just being triggered or started once we create a, an entry in a data list. And then depending on what we have created in the data list, a certain workflow is being picked. And then once the workflow runs, it can update the data list because, of course, we can you know, store the information about the data list entry in the workflow, and the workflow can update it. Um, and once it is done, we have the final status is checked, and we might trigger some action for the user to know, to let him know that something happened. Yeah? And this is actually what we can do with policies. Yeah? So on the repository, we can implement policies, which, fire, which will fire events, or actually our fresco is firing events, on certain actions within the repository whenever something takes place. And we can hook in our own code. So for example, if somebody creates a data list entry, some code will run, will check on what we have done, and trigger a workflow. And this is pretty, pretty easy, actually. It's not, it's, not high, it's not rocket science. It's just basic stuff. And we have just to be a little bit uh, kind of creative where to hook in our code um, to get these uh, things done. So activity. Now coming to the process engine. Um, activity, case management out of the box. Yeah, OK, activity is a workflow engine, not a case management solution. So we have, of course, in Alfresco some default workflows. It's this ad hoc workflow. It's a, ref a review approved workflows, and so on. And uh, for everybody of you who j uh, joined Joram's talk yesterday with the Kickstarter, so I, they are coming up with some tool that you can create your kind of uh, sim uh, your workflows directly within share, and you don't have to code much. So um, this is coming in, uh, I don't know, what was it? 2013, right? <laughs> At some point. <laughs> so not necessarily in the next version, but um, somewhere, somewhere down the road. Um, so then um, yeah, you, can, you can create your, your, your um, custom workflows with this tool as well. Um, so now, coming with the solution we are currently working on uh, and which is unfortunately a little bit delayed uh, in Jakarta. So um, we thought about how we can we support this kind of active, adaptive case management in activity and in fresco. So um, what we are currently working on is some basic um, customizations to the repository. So we are going to provide um, some um, custom metadata model or content model with case group, con case group containers so that we can organize cases. Then we have case folders. Um, we have case files. We have aspects which provide a basic set of, uh, uh, of case-related metadata. And also configuration metadata, which will allow us to kind of configure certain case scenarios differently because different lines of business, different, uh, different industries have different requirements and we want to have it flexible. And we are implementing case checklists which will, be able to, which will be able to trigger workflows and being updated by workflows. So we kind of, it will be kind of a framework um, to, to create your own uh, um, kind of case management solution on top of it. Um, we will provide some basic activity workflows to run on folder chains. So folder chain is something like the, the simple workflow in, uh, in, in, in Alfresco. And um, this will allow the user to have the benefits of having a workflow which is running with task lists and, and all these kind of things. But it runs on a folder chain which uh, users can, uh, can create by themselves. We'll have status and all this stuff. And for all of you who attended the training on Monday, they have already seen something uh, like this. Um, We'll create some base case, basic case workflows. And this is a 
main case status workflow. So this is actually a workflow running as long as a case is running. And it will just maintain the status, so it will get events and stuff so that it can uh, kind of con um, aggregate all the status information of the case. Um, um, we will Im implement something like an identify expert workflow, an external assessment workflow, request additional documents workflows, and so on. So it's all small pieces, not a big workflow, which can be initiated by the user on request or on demand, or it can also be kind of integrated into the, uh, into the checklist, for example, that the user can pick, okay, for this item, which workflow do you want to start? And then it's running and it's updating the status on the checklist and also on the kind of enclosing um, main case status flow. We'll do also some share customizations, additional folder views. The case folder is actually the one where all the information should go in, and it's not necessarily just the documents which are located in the folder, but also information which is coming from other areas, like SOP documents, other documents which are required. And these templates um, will be kind of, uh, sorry, this will be based on templates. So some basic stuff will be there, and the remaining stuff will be configurable. So it's not um, for the basic, so it's kind of a template which can be extended by configuration, so you don't necessarily have to code. If you want to have certain things in, you have to code, but for the basic stuff, for example, including another folder, including another data list and stuff, this will go in. We will bring in uh, the data list on case folders. Currently, the data lists are just on sites, but the data list, of course, we need on a folder on a case folder because it's case specific, not site specific. So uh, we'll do some UI tricks to bring data lists uh, into, the, uh, into the case folders as well. Yeah? And this is just a foundation. So it's kind of a toolkit providing some, some basic uh, functionality. For, for us who are, uh, who are developing it, it's more like a proof of concept and kind of getting to know all the functionalities which are in Alfresco. But we want to achieve something which is also kind of usable for the rest of the Alfresco community. So that's why we put up, a, or actually this morning I just put it up, sorry. <laughs> but um, we put up a Google, uh, Google code project and it's on the slides. And yeah, next week or in two weeks later, you will have the first, uh, let's say, version of, of this um, um, on, on, on the internet. So now, when it comes to implementing case management, we have different versions of Alfresco and activity, and we have to understand uh, when it will work well and when it won't. So um, I hope that nobody is on an older version than 3.4. If you are, yeah. Um, um, you should update, actually. So um, the repository, this, uh, the Alfresco stuff here is just a repository. So core functionality is easy to extend, and actually it's all versions. There are not too many changes. Of course, there are some things being added, but for the core stuff like action framework, transformation framework, metadata extractors, all these kind of things, it's all there in all versions, and it's mainly, it's, it hasn't changed. Um, re replication. It's not existing in 3.4. In 4.0, it's being supported, but not necessarily very well. I don't have any clues what's going to happen here with 4.2, but with all the cloud stuff, I assume that it will be much better than what we are having currently in 4. <laughs> right? So if you need replicate data from one of your other systems, most probably 4.2 is the version to go for. When it comes to share, to share the version 3.4, uh, if you want to customize it. They have built in some extension points here already, but um, mm, it's not perfect, right? So in 4, it has become much easier. And in 4.2, it becomes even better because now they have this kind of new marker, so you can, you can tweak more areas and you plug it in. The model support is uh, basic in 4, and it's much better in 4.2. Um, that's actually my opinion. Maybe the Alfresco engineers have a different view on this one. I don't want to go into a flame war here. That's just my, yeah, and if, my, if I see it wrongly, you can easily correct me. About activity. Unfortunately, activity hasn't been updated from 5.7 until now. And uh, there are some bugs in activity 5.7. Um, 
and some features missing which are really cool, especially when it comes to, uh, to adaptive case management. For example, um, one cool thing is in BPMN is call activity. So you can call another process which is not a sub-process embedded in your workflow, but it is a stand which is a standalone, standalone process which you can call. And um, there is normally an expression statement which you could use to dynamically decide which workflow or which sub-process to call. And uh, there is a bug here in 4.7 which prevents it from functioning. The functionality is already there, the bug, the bug uh, prevents it. There are no signals. A signal is actually that you do something in one process and when you throw a signal or when you send out a signal, it will uh, kind of signal all other, project, uh, all other processes, not just the process instances of the same process, but all other processes. And um, this can be used for updating, for example. Yeah? For example, if you, have a, um, if, you do, if you do in one step, you do a calculation of a price and then the prices change then you can signal, okay, price has changed and all the instances running which, which are dependent on this price change will have a chance to, to update the price and calculate the, uh, calculate the new price, right? Uh, compensation is about uh, not necessarily can run everything in one within one transaction. So with, con uh, with compensation, you can kind of roll back things. Yeah? So if, something, if some events happening, you can kind of... Uh, roll back the things in a manual mean it's so it's out of transaction rollback actually. Um, so there are some stuff with messages and other cool stuff which is all not in, in 5.7 but which is in, in 5.10. And um, if, you wanna, if you wanna implement something on uh, activity, have a look at the, um, at the user guide and see what's there and then have a second look on which version you are on because that was a problem with me. We are running activity 5.10 in, uh, in Allianz, and when I wanted to prepare some nice examples, they all didn't work because the features weren't there. <laughs> so I had to step back. So uh, for activity, I, I would say you wait for 4.2. Yeah. Okay, so actually I think I'm over time already, 10 minutes. So this is actually the nice features which are in 5.10, they're not yet there. Um, so, yeah, the implementation will come as a community project. The goal is, for our goal is to learn about our fresco by doing something useful. Um, we missed the delivery date, sorry for that. Um, we will deliver in September, uh, in November, and this is actually where it can be found. And the presentation will be on the conference uh, page so you can download it. And now questions, any questions? Yeah. Uh, you haven't mentioned uh, business activity monitoring. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly d uh, due to lack of time, you haven't mentioned business activity monitoring. Mm -hmm. But I assume that you can still use your, your normal business activity monitoring. Yeah. Or is it this is, no, no. Um, if you if you if you want to use business activity monitoring or uh, central event uh, central event processing, this can be done. Mm -hmm. But this is not this is not. Um, uh, this is not uh, not a kind of a core functionality of activities. Kind of you, you integrate activity with external tools, and actually this is relatively. Um, th there is a, a great description of how it works from conceptual side and also from an implementation side with a fr with activity in the activity in action book. Yeah, so there is this activity in action book, and it provides many use cases besides of 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 just activity and of Resco. Yeah. One other question. Um, is it also that uh, the, 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 the pro your process that you define is actually in, in the folder and not in a separate workflow? Y your main uh, um, process, so to say. No, no the, um, actually, um, there is no, uh, the, when, you, when you look at a, ca at a case, yeah, the case starts and the case ends. What's, what's going on in between is uh, kind of dependent. If you have a routine case, yeah, for example, you have a car accident, your bumper is dented and, and stuff, this is you know, pretty routine. So there is no, it's also case management, but you know, this can be automated and rerun. 
Um, but if it's kind of a complex thing, you have a total loss because there was an avalanche and, and whatever, yeah? And it's not necessarily clear if it's, you know, if, if, if the community has been warned, please move your cars all out of this area because there is an avalanche going to happen, yeah? And you, you just ignored it. Might, you know, the, the insurance company might not pay. So um, it's co that's already complex case. So when it comes to the pros, uh, to the workflow, we will, we will implement some, some workflow which is running from end to end so that you have kind of kind of the status, but it will just maintain the status, nothing, nothing in between. Um, uh, and, uh, in, and in parallel, you will have uh, small workflows, which the, uh, the, the, the knowledge worker or the person working on a case or whatever yeah, can start by himself. And uh, these are running in parallel and just want, will update information. And this will all go into the folder, because the folder is actually where the information is being maintained. Okay, so you got a, you had a question. You got a, you get a T-shirt. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. In, in real life situations, you have different case types with all yeah. different metadata, which you need some kind of a, a configuration window where you can like determine the terms in it, so the we length will, of the case. Okay, what we are uh, that's correct. So what we are going to implement is kind of a base, a base class uh, for or base type for 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 um, for your um, for cases, mm -hmm. and then whenever you want to implement something, when you might, when if you want to use it and you have special requirements, you can derive your type from the case type, so all the functionality will work, and you can add additional metadata, either by means of aspects or by, by creating a subtype, right? So yeah, but that's, I mean, um, oh, I mean, I've also developed a lot of case management on top of a fresco, mm -hmm. and uh, what you really see in real life, that they really want some kind of a configuration window, like what we do is uh, make uh, just special folders, yeah. for the case type folders, and uh, Pull metadata from an external system. Yeah, that's what. So, like what? terms, etc. And mm -hmm. then uh, every time a, a new case has been created or workflow starts, that metadata is like the boundary of your workflow. So, yeah, like yeah. the length, the start length, or, or yeah, these kind of info. Yeah, uh, it should go to, etc. So that's and that's, so that's not something I really saw. That's what we are going to implement as kind of aggregated views. So we bring in some templates so that it's not so that you necessarily have to customize for your you know, requirements the whole uh, types, mm -hmm. but the information will go in as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's different means. OK. Uh, I think we have to, we have to, yeah, to move. <laughs>